actually. Kanye is um Kanye's been a, on a bit of a tear, right? Can we say that right as about now from the whole Jesus King album promotion? Um I think this is probably his best interview so far. I had this theory that Kanye gives better his best interviews usually come around his best interviews are when he's been interviewed in front of a creative design led entrepreneurial audience when he's basically being interviewed by quote unquote white people he gives his best interviews i think when he's on those hip-hop stations or radio shows or podcasts they're always very fractious because there's always an underlying element of him trying to prove his blackness um loads of hip-hop card conversations happening or questions um, he always feels like he's having his back against the wall especially with the whole trump um, support over the last few years they're very combative right they're not they don't make for good interviews which is probably why he he likes to do the same low interviews of course there's probably some payola involved there where someone's getting paid some money there's probably some deal there behind the scenes with def jam we don't know with apple who knows allegedly but there's a reason why he probably likes to do say low interview because you know you know he's not going to get much pushback it's going to be pretty um you know pretty um plain sailing um, but if you want to hear Kanye talk, you know, that really cool, motivational, inspirational design um, talk, then your best bet is to really see him talk in front of a panel, especially when it comes to design and award show, um, whatever it may be. Those are where you're going to really get the best out of Kanye, right? And um, you don't really see Kanye on panel discussions too often, in it, really? I wonder why. Maybe that's a purposeful thing. He's very particular about who he sits next to. But this panel discussion or this, this interview was with Fast Company. He sat alongside Steve Stephen Smith, who was responsible for designing the Yeezy 700, um, the original one, the Wave Runner, uh, the original Dad Shoe. He also comes from New Balance and done loads of stuff with them, some stuff with Puma and Reebok. He's got a really long, his, storied history in sneaker design. But the interesting part about this whole interview is twofold. I think one is that we saw the debut of the Clog that we saw Kanye or I think his kids debut a few a few weeks ago. Now it's kind of been updated a bit. I think there's a lot a lot more added detail in it. It's all one unit. I think it's made. I think it's all one unit. Maybe it might be um, two pieces. I'm not too sure. Um, it's made out of a combination of EVA. So very interesting to see what that kind of feels like. I'm interested to see how it's going to be. Um, in, I'm interested to see how that's going to be. Um, received by the sneaker public because in my experience again let me see if i can find it uh yeezy clog right in my experience especially these days with the sneakerheads i think some sneakers are quite they're, they're not the most ad, ad, adventurous buyers or trainers out there they're very much stuck in their ways and don't necessarily try to wear new things um, I think if this was back in the day of old sneakers, I think we'd be all over this and we'd be very much down for it. But I'm not sure if people are going to be down for it as much as I am. But I thought the clog was very much an interesting shoe that they debuted here, as you can see, um, full of uh, loads of perforation. I think this is the first time we saw the clog was when Northwest was wearing it, right? And now we see an updated version of it, loads of interesting perforations, and it comes together really well. You know, it kind of reminds me. It reminds me of a little bit of a, of a Zaha uh, Zaha Hadid architecture. Let's see if I can find it, right? Architectural building. So Zaha Hadid, let's see, right? It kind of looks similar to that. Loads of really cool swoops and curves and different sort of perforations. It kind of reminds you a little bit of some uh, a building Zaha Hadid with, with a design. What do you think? I think it looks a little bit like that. Pretty pretty similar to it, no? So loads of the deep building. So that's what the clog looks like. Um, again, reception wise, I'm interested to see what it looks like because how it gets received by sneakers because it reminds me a little bit of the Air Mock, which is a really um, influential um, niche underground sort of appreciated nike a a a um a a a a c g shoe from back in the day oh, fucking no man um a c g mock one of my favorite shoes um i think it's kind of styled uh, from uh, i think it's from a potato the inspiration it came from from potato the artist kind of from what he said it so it kind of reminds me similar of this sort of shoe which again wasn't that well received i think it got retro two or three times by nike um every time it got retro they never really sold that well i remember when i used to work at 1948 like we had loads of these pairs lying around i was able to get i was able to double up on a few of them i sold a couple of them because they didn't fit too right but again one of my more favorite shoes i think it was kind of a most of a mountain climbing shoe a hiking shoe but something very very interesting that i would like to add to my collection again something very much different from what you'd see in more people's collections but i'm not sure people are going to be into them as much as i am into them but I'm interested to see how they how they get received going forward. The the clog, sorry, where are they? Where's the clog? There you go. There, this clog there. I'm interested to see how it gets received. So that was a very interesting part of the interview. They was talking about how he's putting it together, the inspiration behind it, and I think this is the next kind of uh, marquee product that they're going to put a lot of money towards out there. And again, I'm interested to see how it gets received. Do do we see a lot of people in the restaurant industry 
a lot of people working within the medical field replace their clogs that they usually wear their crocs to wear something like this let's see wait wait and see if that is the case what how they're going to be priced that be just two what, what's the soul is the soul the 700 soul similar bit with the holes in it so yeah that goes as well but another part of the interview that was very interesting that i thought was probably the most interesting part of the interview was kanye essentially revealed um what went into what kind of led to his breakdown and why the whole virgil the virgil friendship broke down and was resurrected and kind of was a bit fractious for a while i think for the most for most um geeks and nerds of streetwear of the culture in general i think we were aware even from the outside looking in that there was some kind of tension between them right in virgil and kanye i think we saw a lot of tension and a lot of a splintering of groups when Kanye started going on these Trump rants and started, you know, acting as if Trump was his stepdad and shit, we saw a real big shift. And I think that was easy, evident or easy to kind of guess because a lot of the people that Kanye used to hang around with, a lot of his creative collaborators are very politically active. They're very socially conscious um, um, and they make their point known, right, about how much it inspires the current president of the United States. So for Kanye to go out there on the limb and specifically, you know, declare his love for, for Trump, you knew it was going to rub people out the wrong way. And we've kind of seen it so far, right? We haven't seen Kanye pictured with Don C ever since. We haven't really seen him pictured with John Legend, with IBM Jasper, with a few other people in his creative group. He's kind of built up or cultivated a whole new group of people now, right? Most of the kids around him are pretty young, right? Because they still look at him like a, an absolute beast, or uh, a creative beast that he is, right? He's a real um, outlier. He's a real unicorn in terms of being able to do exactly what he wants when he wants, which is why you see people like ASAP Rocky and Tyler Creator still next to him and still supporting what he does because they can kind of separate the politics with the artist, right? And kind of see that by and large, he's been able to amass a great fortune doing exactly what he wants, not listening to anybody and really kind of carving his own way. And he's kind of finally reached a point where he's got fuck you money, is able to do exactly what he wants, which is probably what uh, Kanye and which is what ASAP Rocky and Tyler Cray are probably aspiring to do in the end. So you can see where that love of appreciation comes from. But his old school friends are kind of nowhere to be seen. And it kind of got you thinking, right? Um, that's probably why we kind of got the feeling, you know, a lot of it would probably stem around, you know, what happened within the, the within his kind of um, inception of the, from the time he debuted on Paris Fashion Week with that, you know, um, ridiculed um, Paris Fashion Week debut that he did out of the blue. To the time that he finally launched Yeezy to all the kind of twos and fro's behind production and kind of rants and raving all that sort of stuff we kind of felt that there was something brewing in the background but we didn't know it was this deep and Kanye basically um explained exactly why he got to a point of you know ending up in a mental institute and this is kind of a clip from the show now I'm going to play for you but I'll link the whole interview in the show notes for you guys to check out yourself <laughs> this is Kanye well, talking no way. The first Adidas collection came out and there were lineups around the store. Then the second collection that we did, no lineups, no store, no backer. I told Adidas that LV Mates, I said, hey Adidas, I'm gonna marry Giselle. I know we just went on prom. I came back, hey Giselle, dump me. Uh, would you, uh, <laughs> you still wanna? And we remember this, right? I remember those rumors. Remember that happened, I think it was after Adidas season one, we realized, or maybe it's season two, that was like, oh, they came out with a statement like, oh, the deal was only a one or two season deal. And now Kanye is going to move his production to LVMH or somebody else. I, think, I don't think it was specified yet who it was going to be. Um, or maybe that was a splinter. I think there was maybe the rumors, there was maybe those rumors about um, the production of the shoes going to move to somebody else. Or maybe Adidas was still going to do the shoes and Kanye was going to do the clothing with somebody else. Maybe I forgot what it was. But it was during the time when Kanye was letting it be known that in order to kind of be a, a, a level, a, I think the example they used was Stella McCartney. In order to produce clothing of Stella McCartney's level, you have to have the backing of the big uh, fashion groups, right? Which is why Stella McCartney eventually ended up re-signing back to think with LVMH recently, right? You need to have their ability to kind of press the button for you to have access to all the production, to all the manufacturing, um, all the distribution to kind of get your product at that level. There is no way you can do it on your own by the most part. You, you can do it on your own to a certain level, but to really permeate culture and to really be, to scale it and to become a billion dollar company, um, especially in terms of popularity, especially in terms of exposure, in terms of availability, you have to be able to kind of marry up with these big um, fashion houses and big corporations. Uh, you still want to? <laughs> so, um, so the second collection, there's no, no Yeezy. The third collection, now 
I'm investing, I can't put Atelier together. You, get, you can't imagine how hard it is to get four amazing pattern cutters in the same room. And that's exactly what goes back to what I said before. Remember I said, <coughs> I think there's a real danger that some of these kids coming up nowadays are too infatuated with being the person in front of the camera or having the marquee job like fashion director, creative director, stylist, photographer. Whereas the real need in the industry are the real gaps or the real areas where you can kind of really penetrate and kind of make a move and really make a mark and really make an impact and really make yourself indispensable uh, when you try and actually learn a craft or try and do the job that are the day-to-day -day jobs that kind of are the underpinnings of this whole industry in fashion. And one of them is pattern cutting. If you, instead of going out there and trying to study fashion communication or those wafty, airy-fairy degrees, why not go out there and study pattern cutting in a very nondescript university, right? Obviously, someone with, you know, some sort of cachet and some sort of name with it, but it doesn't need to be the University of the Arts. It can be wherever, it can be whatever university is out there, but actually learning how to actually pattern cut and actually going out there in the workplace and doing it for random brands like Zara or Inditex or whatever it may be. And then kind of working way up through the fashion um, hierarchy and ladder and kind of exposing some different designers. That will then that will then involve you. You will be front and center of the scene. You'll be in and amongst it. You'll be indispensable. People will wonder you from all over the place, right? And if you look at every... Have you ever seen fashion documentaries and seen the people that actually work in ateliers? Who they, who they happen to be? They're usually older ladies, right? People that look like your mums. Who are working our mums right they're working in these kind of places usually because there's no knowledge transfer the kids coming up nowadays aren't necessarily going for those kind of courses so there's no one for those women to go and kind of you know take under their wing and act as an apprentice and kind of bestow the knowledge on so these women are kind of you know working and until their fingers bleed you know until the ripe old ages of wherever it may be pa getting paid very well don't get me wrong but you know that knowledge is them being lost when these people move away or pass away Whereas if kids are coming up nowadays and are instead of trying to focus on being the one percenter and being the kind of person at the end of the runway, why not try and be the person behind the scenes who's making sure that that show runs on time, who's casting, who is, um, I don't know, just managing the artists themselves or the designer and making sure the schedule is where it needs to be. Those are very much important places of very much, very, very important um, aspects of the industry that are very much overlooked by the kids coming up nowadays. I hope going forward, kids see nowadays that, you know, if you want to be involved, really, get a real job in the scene. You don't need to be these, you know, these kind of surface level things that make you look successful. But by and large, you know, you don't really have any money to buy lunch. But you look like, you, you know, on your profile, you have like your stylist for ID magazine. That isn't necessarily what the dream should be about. The dream should be about being able to live and breathe the scene, work within it, and it pay you a decent amount, you know, in terms of wage where you can, you know, have a roof over your head and go on a couple of holidays a year. It's not to just to look in front like your stylist carrying those massive IKEA bags full of clothing, but you have no money to pay rent. You know what I mean, that isn't the move. Right. So I'm trying to put this atelier together and um, I'm tweeting at Mark Zuckerberg. Hey, I'm in debt. I'm just triple title. Adidas is up. We're doing this. Mark, I heard you're looking for aliens. It's an alien right here. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> Season four. We start 45 minutes late. Now, season three killed them. MSG, a thousand people. We dropped the album. Young Thug is on the stage. Or Travis Scott is jumping up. Virgil's standing right there. Everybody, 50 Cent and Jay Z, everyone's in, a, in the audience. Season four, we start 45 minutes late. Oh, it got to be LeBron James territory right there. Like when LeBron said, I'm going to the Heat, they were like, boy, you was late. <laughs> Then a week later, my wife got robbed. Then a week later, I was tired and ended up in the hospital. Then a year after that, Bernard Arnault could have picked anybody he wanted to be the head of Louis Vuitton. And who was it? And as I got on that flight, I knew I had to go. Because if I didn't go and give Virgil that hug, who was I then? And that explains a lot now. That explains a lot about Kanye's... Um recent actions i've always kind of maintained that a lot of the breakdown happened you know as soon as a lot of the breakdown was kind of um caused maybe partly by obama's comments right when he said he's a jackass remember that comment in passing i think they picked up on a mic when obama didn't know he's being recorded and he mentioned something about oh, something someone mentioned something about kanye do something crazy and he was like oh that guy's a jackass right so Obama didn't have anything to say about Kanye. And I think ever since then, Kanye has kind of been questioning 
himself and everything around him, right? He's been on a bit of a tear. Uh, relationship with Jay-Z obviously deteriorated. The stuff with Drake is obviously ongoing. And this in general has been a bit fraught. It's been an up and down contest. And of course, if you're Kanye West and you, I think, probably secretively and probably maybe public, publicly, would he would probably say he's probably 10 times the designer Virgil is. For, for that spot at Louis Vuitton that you thought you were going to get, that you were destined to get, calling yourself the Louis Vuitton Don, collaborating on the Louis Vuitton sneakers, eventually grinding down Bernard no to give you a deal with LVMH and then for it to fall through last minute and then for a year, a year later be, it be given to your protege or for your assistant or for your creative director it can be a hard pill to swallow and it, and I think most people most people get jealous you know most people get I, mean, I remember when I used to work at Dr. Martin's right and um, there was a we had um, we, they, we they put us yeah we, I worked at Dr. Martin's and it was an occasion where the supervisor role came available, right? And this was at a time when, you know, I was working in retail, my head was all in retail, and for some reason I put the supervisor role way up on the fucking pedestal, and so did my other colleague who I was kind of coming up against it. So because we put it up against, because we put it up on such a pedestal, um, when really, in in effect, the only benefit was that you were getting paid a pound extra an hour than your regular full-time salary, and you got the added pressure of having the keys, being the key holder, and also having to do the rotor, and also having to be the, you know, um, the in-house psychologist for all your colleagues' problems, right? You had to constantly be putting out fires and you know personally managing relationships and making sure people didn't rip each other apart, right? So that was the that was basically the gift that you got given for being a supervisor. But I remember at that time, um, we were both going for the same job, and the other guy got really annoyed and really pissed off about me getting it, right? To the point where he essentially quit and stopped talking to me for a while. So imagine that's a very you know minute, um, insignificant bullshit reason to not be friends with somebody right because you know you're jealous that they got a job that you wanted it's not even a job that anyone gives a shit about nowadays right so imagine how how much it would hurt if it was you know nowadays in your adult years and you're trying to make us trying to make a mark in a creative world which is already fraught with politics like it's politics and loads of you know barriers and obstacles you need to overcome societally social um, um what you call it racially economically loads of things that you kind of navigate through that are not you know um available or knowledge or not everyday knowledge that people will be aware of and then suddenly you get put in a position where you're pitting against somebody who was you know once your creative collaborator it can be very hard to deal with and again it can explain why he's so he's so like you know traumatized or in this weird moment that he's in now i think it's been helped a little bit so far I think Kanye would be in a far worse position if Yeezy didn't pick off, if Yeezy didn't pick up. If somehow the Trump support affected his Yeezy sales and Yeezy was kind of struggling to make any money, I think we'd see a far worse version of Kanye. I think the thing that gives Kanye solace is that even though people say what they want to say about him and quote unquote try and cancel him, the numbers don't lie, right? People still buy his trainers, people still go and attend his shows, uh, people still come out to see him at Sunday service, he still sells tons of merch. So all the bits that he kind of values, whether it comes in terms of commerce, in terms of creativity, in terms of, um, yeah, creativity and idea exploration, people are so receptive to it, right? They want to see his shows. They want to see his stage designs. They're receptive to see how he sonically puts together an album. Like, people are curious about him still. So I think that kind of puts him in a position where he's able to be like, okay, cool. I didn't get that job, but at least I still got this thing. Because I dread to think what would have happened if he would have, because it could, that, could, that explains everything, right? He loses, he, he finally grinds down LVMH to get a deal. They decide, yes, we're going to give you a deal and we're going to enlist the help of Stefano Pilati, right? And fucking, you know, legendary designer, formerly of YSL, who's now got his own brand, right? Random Identities. We're going to get you alongside Heike Aikerman, who Kanye is a big fan of Heike Aikerman, right? He's always wearing his bomber jackets and trousers and hoodies. And just in general, he's, he's, not, he's somebody that a lot of people in that scene, a lot of people within Kanye's circle have a lot of love for and appreciation for. He's able to, his ability to kind of, you know, um, sprinkle his uh, chic powder on kind of really mundane items. To have those three people heading up a Yeezy brand backed by LVMH, it was bound to be a, a fucking, you know, a killer success. So for that to be kind of pulled under from under your feet, and then for a year later, for your wife to get robbed by allegedly by one of the most notorious uh, crime gangs or crime syndicates in the world in the Pink Panthers, right? They went in, jewelry heist, tied his wife up um, and took everything that they own or they love in terms of jewelry. So much so it completely changed how they conduct themselves now, right? They don't have any expensive items in their house, no expensive paintings, no expensive jewelry. Everything is very um, um, kind of lowbrow. 
no kind of you know um need to know sort of like you know re- replica some of it's replica items i'm sure they have in the household because they don't want to have the real thing there but most of it is they invest in furniture they don't wear a you know crazy amounts of jewelry unless they go into particular events and sometimes even costume jewelry i think kind of comes and we confess that they operate with you know navy seal level um of security around them in order to make sure they're not in the same situation again those situations kind of defined what happened later on then he, then he goes into the crazy house and comes out and he kind of loves with trump but you can see why it led up to that kind of experience you can see why because i think most people even the everyday people on the scene if they were in a situation where their best friend got the job that they wanted you know, they would probably do worse than what Kanye's doing at the moment. But I honestly think the saving grace for his sanity and for our collective sanity is that Yeezy is still successful nowadays. Um, I think if that would have flopped off the back of his successful of, of, of his endorsement for Trump, we would have seen a far worse Kanye. Honestly, a far worse. But I really recommend you check out the interview. It's a very insightful interview. Um, Stephen Smith talks really glowingly as well about his interaction with Kanye, about how Kanye changed his life. I think he quit um, New Balance out the blue because he felt as if they were going in the wrong direction. And then suddenly he did, wasn't sure what he was going to do. And then suddenly a call from Kanye comes out of the blue. And, you know, serendipity, you know how those things work out. It's amazing. You make one leap in one way and then you know, someone offers you their hand and pulled him from out of a dark place. Um, so you see how much you know Kanye's impacted his life and just in general you see how, how much love and how much enthusiasm Kanye has for this path of his life he's in I don't think we're ever going to get sonically or musically what we once were expecting from Kanye from back in the day I think now his best work is going to be put in design so I think if you want to support Kanye and you still love his vision you love what he does the best way to do it is probably invest or support him in his design in his clothing in his shoes um, whether it comes in the, the terms of housing he's going to be putting through in the future those are going to be a place to really um to really get the best of kanye um creative output um also another good point on the interview was that they're going to bring the manufacturing of the yeezy 700s back into the us which is really really interesting to see how that kind of rolls out and just in general some really good talk about how his business is scaled up valuations the fact that he gave Forbes uh, a receipt of eight a receipt showing that he had 800 and 890 million in the bank or something like that so close to a billionaire um just in general just a really cool interview I really want to check it out this is probably the best of the run of interviews he has so far which is no surprise because again he's, he's in front of a crowd that are very receptive to his uh, creative talents and stuff and are able to put his endorsement of Trump to one side but again very interesting very entertaining uh, very enlightening interview I'll put it in show for you guys to check out but yeah, it's there. The headline uh, it's called um, Kanye West Uncensored and Uncut by the First Company. But I'll put a link in the show notes for you guys to see yourself.